So I, I think that the biggest value there would be to see what Estonia did and why it did, but not uh, follow it step by step. Yeah. You need to take into account that the world is different today than it was mm -hmm. uh, 20 plus years ago. Welcome to this podcast created by the Estonia Briefing Center. In this series, we invite some of the most influential people in politics and business to discuss all angles of digitalization in Estonia and the world. From past learnings to current challenges and future plans. So take a seat, pour yourself a glass of your favorite drink and enjoy the art of digitalization. Well, uh, hello and welcome to another iteration of the art of digitalization. Uh, today we have with us Christo Vaher. He is the chief technology officer uh, of the Republic of Estonia. My name is Florian Marcus. I'm a digital transformation advisor at the Estonia Briefing Center. Uh, first of all, uh, Christo, thank you so much for hosting us here at your home ministry, at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications. Thank you for taking the time oh, as yes. well. Yes, yes, yes. Very nice rooms you. here. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's uh, I'm also sort of a visitor here because during the COVID era, haven't actually been here much, I think, a few times the past few months. So uh, it is uh, a refreshing experience for me as well. We're slowly returning to, to normal, but uh, it is a very new normal. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know whether if at all, we will sort of return to sort of daily office jobs or not really. But uh, I, I think we will talk about that uh, later on as well. So I want to start this conversation with with perhaps a small primer on Estonian e-government structures. So many people have asked this uh, to us at the briefing center as well. Um, so I figured it would be a good way to kick this off. Um, could you maybe explain to us which people and what organizations within the Estonian government, are responsible for shaping where Estonian e-government goes? Can you give us a small overview of that? Yes, definitely. That's a, that's a great answer. And I've I had to answer those questions uh, previously in the past as well. I, I think the most patriotic way for me to answer this is to sort of say that everybody, uh, I think that all the ministries and, uh, and all the officials and everybody that is participating, including the private sector, is contributing to our uh, e-government in one way or another. Um, I, I definitely do think that this is something that we are not in many cases handling separately. I think it is really sort of something that, that, that has been or at least has been ingrained uh, to Estonia over the past uh, 20 or so years. And and I totally believe that everybody's contributing. And this is especially prominent uh, due to the fact that we have strategically uh, built our in-government structure in a decentralized manner. Uh, so it's not the central thing. So I think that this helps sort of make sure that everybody is involved because if we make the tools really close to the administration sectors uh, and have them sort of uh, modify or configure or tweak the way their digitalization is happening then it sort of becomes ingrained with uh, their business architecture and, and their technical architecture and digitalization strategy as a whole. Well, you've been very humble here, but of course, you know, some people play more of a role in, in designing digital services than others. Of course, every single person does play a role. Um, but maybe you could tell us more about uh, what you do as the chief technology officer uh, for Estonia. Um, this is to sort of, again, like give a little bit more clarity here is that... Uh, what we are doing in our ministry, really, and with our department uh, that is developing our, our sort of digital strategy for the uh, government technology and, and whatnot is, uh, is that we are defining the policies and the principles. Uh, so, And this applies to all of our uh, main crucial roles in our digitalization, including uh, chief uh, technology officer, as well as data officer, as well as our mm. cybersecurity team, as well as uh, up, up to uh, our CIO. Yeah. So... We are driving primarily the policy because if we have 
ended up in a strategic decision that everything is decentralized, uh, which means that everybody can build their own stuff, then we need to make sure that there's some sort of um, interoperability solved uh, between all the parties mm -hmm. and the similar principles followed between all the parties, which is what we are driving pr uh, primarily. And uh, while strategic vision for the technology and the technological roadmap and innovation is uh, some of the, are some of the things that are in my portfolio, uh, I'm also leading our sort of engineering community uh, from the public sector side, which means coordinating the architects to sort of uh, argue about or uh, agree together like various principles and and sort of requirements to be followed in in order to uh, deploy new technologies or develop uh, new kind of information systems. So this is like on the side. So primarily we are uh, driving the policy part, which I think Jeff Bezos once said that, you know, you need to be really strict and concrete in your policies and you need to be flexible in your details. So uh, this is a similar principle that we have really uh, like taken at heart. Uh, and I also believe that this is one of the reasons why we have been successful at what we are doing mm. is that we make sure that, you know, the core principles are followed, that we are using Xroad, uh, that we're using our EID and whatnot. But all the details, like like whatever the needs might be in different areas, are for the details that can be decided uh, by the administration sectors themselves, mm -hmm. as long as the principles and policies are followed. Yeah. Could you maybe tell us more about uh, the closer or specific projects that you are working on these days? Maybe, maybe you, can, you can give us a bit more of a view behind the scenes. Uh, at the moment, what we are working on uh, is to sort of build a single sort of information portal or an environment uh, where all of those principles that I mentioned and that I didn't mention that because there are plenty of them uh, would be combined. Today, if someone were to ask, like, how would I design a new service in mm -hmm. uh, in Estonia for, for uh, e-government, for example, uh, then there's no very clear answer for this. You would have to know the right people that would be able to give you the most actual up-to-date information. Yeah. So one of the things that we're doing is we're creating a new sort of web portal or information uh, portal that will give you those answers. Mm -hmm. But not only that, it's like in, in one way, it's the good old website that that you know uh, combines all of our general principles to be followed, all, uh, our interoperability framework, our cross-functional requirements for technologies, uh, some of the stuff that you can reuse or uh, or develop or or perhaps even contribute to yourself. But on the other side, we also intend to do this sort of um, problem. Um, gathering or uh, idea gathering uh, environment mm -hmm. where everybody can contribute their ideas or propose solutions for our e-government. And some of those uh, ideas that might be proposed in this environment uh, will end up being, for example, a source for hackathons, mm -hmm. which we uh, did a few before the COVID-19 became a thing, uh, which, was, which were really successful. So we gathered ideas at that point as well, but we want to make it more transparent what kind of ideas there are and if uh, certain ideas have perhaps ended up as actual live services or have affected our e-government architecture or service delivery in some way. So uh, we are at, at most like right now focusing on making sure that we would have the procurement for this kind of system mm -hmm. uh, ready and hopefully deploy it live uh, by autumn uh, this year. On the other side of the coin that we're really working on is our next uh, sort of strategy document for our government or e-government uh, in whole. Our, uh, our strategic document is, uh, not, not to say outdated, but it's expired uh, mm -hmm. at the end of last year. So now we're working on the new one. We started actually this work already way before last year, but uh, it is now being polished uh, and uh, we're going to see what's going to like really bring us forward there, including stuff such as virtual assistants and whatnot, which mm -hmm. we can obviously talk for hours about if needed. But uh, <laughs> we're trying to keep this to yes. thirty minutes. Yes. Um, one thing that actually uh, stuck out to me at the the first part of what you mentioned was uh, the sort of style guide direction, um, where like we're trying to uh, create a, a sort of universal style or service design for as many services as possible. Um, this stood out to me right now. If we look at some of the portals, they have very similar design language um for example the transport authority stands out to me as a beautiful example of uh, of you know what what services can look like and then on the on the other hand you might have things like like the healthcare portal which looks a bit dated but in my opinion actually i i thought <laughs> i wasn't sure whether there was a reason behind this but for me i thought uh well elderly use this portal particularly often 
uh, understandably. And and for them, I know that for my parents, shout out if you're listening, uh, that, <laughs> uh, you know, when, when WhatsApp updates uh, its design or something and the login button or the message button is all of a sudden on the other side of the screen, they're all confused. So so for some for some portals, maybe there is actually a point in being very careful about how you change the design language and the layout and so on. So does that also affect uh, those sort of decisions? Uh, I agree with you very much. Mm. I, I think that like, we can go controversial there. I would say that you know the good old uh, web user interfaces are dead anyways. Uh, Certainly because, the term, yeah. B- because yeah. in reality, if you're dealing with a website, unless it's something that you're actually using every single day, so there might be things such as your Gmail, there might be things such as your Facebook, uh, s- stuff that you're actually using every single day, mm-hmm. you can understand certain changes when they happen there and they can frustrate you. But this level of frustration is much, much, much worse if it's uh, with stuff that you don't deal with every single day. Yeah. So, for example, even our government web portal um, that is a single digital gateway for all of our government services, every change there is going to be much more of a problem, regardless of how great it is done. Mm-hmm. Because every single time you visit the website, you have to relearn it. You have to sort of figure out again, like, what was the logic behind these things? Because there's no universal logic for for great sort of information service design, because there are always exceptions, and those exceptions are going to be the bother for you. And there may be good reasons for those exceptions, but it's still going to make it difficult to, to sort of unify that. Yeah, true. But this is this is why we are really looking at, at the moment, to sort of figure out if, if we can add a separate layer there or actually transform this long term. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that in the 10 or 20 years' time, we're still going to have these information websites. You're still going to have to deal with uh, some of those web forums that are clumsy and and really unhelpful in how you're filling them and and have to deal with all of those related errors but uh, to figure out if we can provide services in a more natural way and Mm -hmm. this is where the whole great ai and uh, bureaucrat concepts have uh, started because the idea there is that if we can make uh, a service delivery for you as natural as possible then you are less inconvenienced about the interface changes So if someone asks a question from you in a different way, Mm -hmm. wording it differently, you're still understanding what they mean. So asking a question differently is something that you take sort of as as part of a natural way of communicating. If Mm -hmm. you talk with another person, they might have a different dialect or they might have a different way of gathering information. And this is fine for you because this has been part of your life ever since you were born. Uh, But with a website, this is not true. So we can have these virtual assistants and the way they can ask information from you Mm -hmm. to be changing, like even every day, as long as you can understand the questions that are being asked and how you're supposed to answer them. So making this kind of transformation is likely not going to only make sure that the innovation of uh, your digital services is becoming uh, sort of more natural for everybody that is used to all those tech stuff, but also for your grandparents. Yeah. Because at, at some point, it's much easier to have, like, uh, let's say, Estonian-speaking Alexa at your grandparents' house that is able to sort of answer their questions or uh, government is able to use that service or Alexa to ask questions about them. Mm. Uh, than having them log on to some government website every single day. But of course, the stuff that I'm talking about is is not immediate. It, it's going to take possibly a generation to develop and, and make sure that it is actually everywhere. But we are heading there. I, I, I truly think that uh, in, in the long future, like once, especially once we are grandparents, it's hopefully <laughs> going to take a long time. But uh, by that point uh, that our communication or digitalized government experience or, or whatever communication I might have with my government is going to be done through those these kinds mm-hmm. of virtual assistants. I think we've already seen uh, plenty of steps, especially in Estonia, uh, in terms of service design. Um, but without wanting to sound too marketing speaky, yeah. uh, perhaps it's time to switch from a service design to a solution kind of thinking so that uh, that it no longer feels like a service so that you just sort of suggest to uh, to exactly. your um, artificial intelligence or voice assistant or anything like that um hey this is my current situation and then the ai thinks oh wait what's connected to that situation xyz do you want this solved like that and so on so there are yeah there are many ways of going about this but this will require a few years of testing probably yeah quite a few but but the good thing is that we can start off small we can we can you know kick off uh, certain small services that do have um this kind of you know virtual assistant support Mm -hmm. without having to topple the whole e-government uh 
because I do think that at the same time, while we are figuring out how to offer various services through virtual assistants, it's not going to immediately mean that there's no alternative, that there's no web forms. You're not going to immediately delete all the websites, yes. no, obviously. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> sure. So so we can take these step by step, yeah. uh, focusing on the less critical services first, and then s- sort of mm. getting our lessons as a result, getting our failures, which is incredibly important, and then figuring out how we're going to uh, do the more critical services later down the road. Yeah. This uh, strikes me as an interesting contrast to how the Estonian government went about in the late 90s and early 2000s, where they started, to, at least to my impression, uh, with some of the biggest services, tax declaration and so on, to sort of, you know, go big or go home. Uh, but now it's a more careful, measured approach, probably, to to make sure that everything works uh, when it's time to go live, uh, probably also because the uh, the risk of of, uh, of attackers uh, and so on is much higher than it used to be in the 1990s when most people didn't even have a computer. So, <laughs> so it's it's yeah, I, I think it's interesting to point out. Um, I, I do think that there might be other other sort of criteria at play when we're talking about tax authority becoming digital first and others, mm-hmm. because it, this is in many ways uh, one of the core foundations how government is Absolutely. being funded. Yeah. Uh, so so this is something that uh, it is critical from the, for the government level to sort of reduce all the paperwork in terms of that and make mm-hmm. sure that more people are able to declare the taxes much, much quicker. But if we look at EID, for example, uh, then we definitely know that the breakthrough didn't happen until EID was used uh, as part of critical services yeah. that every every day people wanted to use, such as banking. E-prescription. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so this was something that uh, for people to start using mm-hmm. uh, needed a, a real-life critical appliance for it. But I think that it's, it's slightly different in terms of like having virtual assistance in your everyday life mm. because uh, if you're visiting today you know, a government web portal and there's a chatbot that might be there that is able to give you the answer much quicker than you would be able to find yourself or find through Google or find through the uh, government website search, mm-hmm. then if this proves itself to you, if you're able to actually get this solution uh, much, much better and more efficiently solved or whatever the problem might be to get this problem solved, uh, then you're going to be more trusting about those services in the future as well. But it is critical when implementing services like this is that when you turn to them, then you're getting your problem solved, even if they're not solving it. This is the same thing with colleagues. Mm. Imagine having, because this is, one of my passions is that it, that's the whole point of technology is to do uh, automate everyday routines. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you have a colleague at work, whenever you turn to them and they just say they don't know every single time mm. without being able to redirect you to another source that might know, then you are less likely in the future to turn to them. Yeah, Which is the same thing that the same principle that should be followed with our virtual assistants. We should... Uh, design from the very ground up the fact that if they don't know the answer, if, if everything is not ideal, how they are able to redirect you to the proper source, yeah. even if it's a web form. Mm-hmm. If uh, you write to the chat button and say that, hey, I need to declare my taxes, can I do it with you? It says no, but you can do it here yeah. and uh, forwards you to the website. And you might even have to log in again. It mm-hmm. doesn't even matter. But you got there much, much quicker than you would have otherwise. And your question was actually understood. I think this is one of the one of the issues where I also get allergic reactions when I hear the word chatbot. Um, then I think of today's chatbots, which are usually, um, hi, can you solve problem X for me? And then it says, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Can you please rephrase your question? Mm-hmm. So so this is something where um, I think also, especially government has to get this right the first time so that people don't Very think, true. oh, I'll try it out, you know? Um, and then they're disappointed and then they'll never use it again. So it's really important that we get this baseline. It's uh, absolutely correct. critical. And this is something that we're working with, um, like working on at the moment uh, a lot. Yeah. Sort of to get to this point where we are able to understand various sets of queries and understand the domains of those queries. Mm-hmm. So it would be, perhaps it doesn't know the exact service, but perhaps it would know that, hey, this is something that 
tax authority can deal with, or this is something that police can deal with. Yeah. And uh, this is very, very critical. And, and we have uh, a lot of partners involved in order to figure out how we're actually going to do it, uh, because it needs to be something that uh, can be flexible, because it, it, it shouldn't depend upon someone writing code. Mm-hmm. It has to be taught, and it has, uh, has to evolve naturally. So at some point, we might have a new field that we d- might not even know that exists today, and we need to have support for that as well. So yeah. it needs to uh, understand and evolve over learnable. time, yeah. especially because also the language is changing. Mm. Uh, Estonians are going to, uh, the younger Estonians are going to grow up, and they're going to use a mix of English and Estonian a lot more. So our services might need to understand this as well. And then the chatbot might have to deal with my broken Estonian as well, which by this point should be a lot better than it actually is. But uh, yeah, I guess... Well, the good yeah. part is that it's going to speak broken Estonian with you in the beginning. <laughs> so I hope it doesn't teach me mistakes either. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that rolls out uh, in a few years' time. Definitely. Um, we talked about data exchange also, which was obviously one of the, you know, big enablers in, in the early 2000s. And the X-Day, uh, so Estonia's version of the X-Road, has been around for almost two decades now. <laughs> um, so almost happy birthday. And it did obviously back then, or even to this day, enabled the different government authorities to exchange data with one another, to talk to each other more uh, securely and efficiently. Um, what does the future hold for the X-Day? Does it still have a place? And if so, where is it? Uh, that question is both ambitious and uh, deserves an ambitious answer. I definitely think that x is going to be there in the future as mm-hmm. well, uh, but it needs to evolve, not just because of technology, but also because of business architecture. Um, the traditional way of how x has been built is that it's uh, it's it's not technically a road, but it's it's a set of rules how two different endpoints can communicate and exchange data between one another. It's a framework. But yeah. the problem is that uh, uh, in, in that type of setup, you need both parties to be there, which is great if this is a very synchronous or critical type of data exchange, but this is not great if you're looking at how actual organizations work. Uh, you don't want to create the situation where a single person uh, being missing from work means that the whole company suffers. Yeah. Uh, and this is something that actually happens uh, with, with the way information systems are designed with extra. Like mm-hmm. if your population registry is down and that is the only source of data, then your other systems need to be uh, like need to be able to handle these kind of uh, problems and, and uh, negative service requests. So uh, in order to make this kind of shift, uh, some of the things that we've been uh, looking at is, is again, again not trying to reinvent the wheel, mm-hmm. but just looking at how some of the most effective um, like startup companies or that really could not be called startup companies anymore uh, have solved a massive data exchange. Mm-hmm. So that we've been looking at Netflix and Spotify, for example. We've been looking at how Amazon has been doing things. And uh, one of the principles there that they're using is they're using a lot of uh, asynchronous message rooms yeah. as a way to solve things, which means that you don't send the message directly to another person, but you send it to a room or sort a department. Leave it there. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And you're going to wait until it gets an answer. This is the same way how here in the podcast we can have another participant join in maybe pick up some of the messages that we're talking about and then once this podcast is over we can continue the conversation or perhaps they will contact me about certain Follow questions up. in the future yeah. Yeah. right and it's not dependent on that person being here mm. like if you have to leave then i can hold my monologue here again for <laughs> extended period of time and it's still going to end up in that computer and it's still being able to be published yeah. right and this is the same kind of uh uh, flexibility that is critical for next generation digitalized systems as well. But in order to do this, we need to enable this kind of uh, asynchronous message rooms mm. for x as well. The second reason why this is important is extremely related to marketing. Because if we are uh, trying to tell other governments that, you know, x is a solution for mm. you as well, and not uh, like... And, and to provide these kind of feature sets, it's going to make x itself more attractive. Yeah. And then, of course, it's going to make uh, cross-border interoperability much, much easier once yeah. uh, uh, a lot of uh, sites are using the same protocols or standards. Mm-hmm. So this is something that is of major focus really here. And we're, we're dealing with uh, NIS, who's the Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions that is developing the core X road to figure out the roadmap for this. Yeah. Uh, the conservative estimates might be like about two years, but we're trying to speed this up mm. because uh, a lot of those uh, feature sets that are required for X road 
we expect to happen slightly sooner because uh, our virtual assistant uh, ecosystem and architecture is dependent on this as well. So the policy and legal nerds will now hear this and wonder, could this potentially spell the death of the once only policy? Um, is, is that a potential topic on the table or how do you treat that with these rooms? I think it actually makes it um, easier to, to be realized. Mm. I, I think that if we look at you know, how we market the idea of once only policy and principles and how it's actually been applied, then I think the marketing is more powerful than the real life execution of it. That is fair. Uh, That's yeah. fair. <laughs> Some of the systems uh, that should be using once only are not using it. Yeah. And we really need to turn this around. And of course, one of the easiest ways how to do it is to have more asynchronous data exchange rather than synchronous one. Mm -hmm. Because in order for uh, if I were to tell you certain data, then uh, in terms of once only principle, I would have to tell it to you and then to your colleague and then to another colleague to make sure that all three parties get it. But if there's a fourth service there, then I'm, without me knowing that they are there, I'm unable to give them this data yeah. set as well, which makes once only principle harder. So if we're able to create uh, sort of these message rooms for certain data that should be considered once only, uh, then we can add participants there and mm -hmm. apply these principles immediately. Where, where we still agree who is the single source yeah. of truth, but it's just this room where exactly. we can leave it behind. And mm -hmm. it's, it's important in terms of, again, you know, the data privacy concerns that might apply there immediately yeah. is that uh, it's very important to be aware of who else has access to this message room mm -hmm. and to be able to see that if you publish messages, who else is listening? Uh, so that you would know that they are in the rooms. Yeah. Simply exactly the same way how in real life it is. Yeah. If you have a message room where you are like holding a conference, you know who is attending. If there is a secret microphone somewhere, then that's a problem. Yeah. So you need to make this transparent and public, obviously. Yeah. And you need to make sure that whoever is publishing data has control over the room who has access to this room. Mm -hmm. Which means that if a new party wants to uh, get access to this room, you need to have the same kind of agreements as you would with Xroad. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we've talked about Estonia's shifts and like how we're slowly moving from one direction into the other, which is perfectly normal, given that technology also does change. Yeah. But do you feel like most countries around the world sort of repeat the same, I don't even want to say mistakes, but the same stages that Estonia is going through? Or do you see any countries that are able to to skip uh, some of these steps, just like Estonia did uh, in in the late 1990s and early 2000s? Yes, I I do think that we need to, like, if we're discussing digitalization, we need to take into account like at what level is the ICT in whole. Mm -hmm. uh, so if if a government were to start today with the digitalization and let's say they are in in a state of how Estonia was in the 90s. Uh, then using the same principles and practices are not going to work out mm -hmm. because, you know, the world is slightly different and the technologies are slightly different. Uh, so I, I think that the biggest value there would be to see what Estonia did and why it did, but not uh, follow it step by step. Yeah. You need to take into account that the world is different today than it was mm -hmm. uh, 20 plus years ago. And this is very, very important. And one of the very frequent questions that, how often, uh, that have been asked from me a lot uh, is that can we use the Estonia's model because Estonia is such a small country? Yes and no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and my my favorite answer really there is that uh, yes you can, but you have to sm uh, start small. The only reason why mm. Estonia was successful in the way that we were was that we were small enough that we could try this thing out nationwide. Mm. If you are in a situation where you cannot do it or your already existing environment is more complicated and more nuanced than it would, was in Estonia in the 90s, uh, then you have to start small. Uh, like perhaps uh, find the state first or find the district first or a city first or, or any kind of local municipality mm. and then figure out the service there and then scale from there. Because this is how you actually make the change happen. You need to have these uh, early... Uh, early adopters as a way to learn what, what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And you can never approach any kind of digitalization problem, especially in e-government e uh, type of uh, scale, as something that we need to apply this to the whole country. We've seen it. We've seen countries try and we've seen them fail, including with mm -hmm. EID, for example. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not a copy-paste uh, situation that you can no, just sort of apply definitely one to not. one. Um, Turning this around, could you name maybe a few e-government areas where Estonia can learn from other countries? 
we like to think of ourselves as, yes, uh, on the top of the world, but also we see that countries like Denmark and so on are catching up. Could you maybe highlight something where you think, oh, what Singapore did was amazing or something like that? Yeah, um, I think there are plenty of examples that we could take uh, lessons from. Uh, and I think we should pay most attention, not uh, just, you know, the, the the countries that have done digitalization well or that are often in the same sentence when Estonia is mentioned. Mm. But I think uh, countries that haven't been on that journey but now are facing this kind of uh, emergence. And uh, so if we look at, for example, at Africa, uh, then we already see that, you know, where the, uh, the way how digitalization is going to develop uh, in Africa, for example, should be something for us to learn from as well. Because uh, in reality, uh, the ecosystem that they are facing with uh, has to take into account changes with the world that we hadn't in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there are countries where, uh, where no country is actually thinking about, you know, buying their own uh, sort of data centers and setting up their own servers. They're immediately going to be cloud. Yeah. And this is the way it's going to be in the future. It's like there's, there's no country that has enough resources or manpower uh, or uh, enough ICT expertise to set up their own data centers for their whole government and keep it up to date. Mm. So it's a compromise. So looking at examples of where some countries are going to do stuff on the cloud, then we should really take lessons from there and see, you know, they did it in this way. What were the principles that they agreed? What were the uh, agreements, how they were able to do some of the stuff in cloud that we are not able to do today? But if we make certain changes, perhaps we can, uh, because doing everything on our own backyard will really, and this is like something that can be quoted, is that we are taking a compromise on quality. Uh, we accept that the people that are working or on, on our data centers uh, are not as competent as the ones that are in Amazon or Google mm. because they are extremely uh, certified, highly paid. They're the experts in this field and have ma uh, manpower and the teams that are experts in the field, unlike what we cannot really match. Mm. So for us to think that, you know, setting up servers or data centers ourselves and having the manpower maintain the quality of this, the servers and uh, and data centers is a little bit short-sighted. Mm. But we have to do it today because we are limited by the rules and regulations that we have set up today. Yeah. So we are really exploring this space. How can we get more stuff uh, to cloud? And uh, every, every country and uh, every government that has been moving towards cloud is an example for us to follow mm -hmm. because there are countries that have done it already that we are really taking uh, lessons from and and uh, learning from yeah uh, this is fascinating stuff uh, i wish we had much more time but uh, i would leave of it to, for, for one more question perhaps what will be if you if you just uh, put on your your um uh, crystal ball hat and the magician hat and so on what will be the big e-government trends for this decade beyond just the sort of the cloud infrastructure, but in terms of services and so on? Well, I already tackled the virtual assistants. I, I, mm -hmm. I do think that we are heading there. Uh, I think that the virtual assistants are going to be the big thing overall. Uh, when we've talked with other highly developed, uh, digitalized uh, governments and countries that have been uh, focusing on this, uh, in including... Finland, including Canada, uh, then we do see that uh, everybody's thinking towards the same sort of solution. Uh, I strongly believe that innovation as such is not happening uh, in the minds of a single person or or, yeah. or sets of single people. It's like if we look at the history, if we look at history, we know that a lot of innovations, when they happened, that there are there's enough instances and enough like proof that the same innovation were just about to happen in another place uh, in, in the separate corner it's of the just world. Just a question of who makes it first. Yes, yeah. because uh, we are really, in, in terms of innovation, we're dealing with the shared knowledge and experience of the whole world. Uh, and with the internet, this becomes even more likely. With globalization, it becomes even more likely. Like engineers are sharing their thoughts uh, across the board with other engineers. And if, if we pay attention to... Uh, the directions that a lot of startups are, are heading towards, the uh, private sector is heading towards, and 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 what uh, uh, inspiring uh, government-oriented uh, or like 
uh, citizen-oriented governments are really focused on, it is to make the service delivery easier Mm -hmm. in order to make sure that whatever government is able to provide to you, or if you need help from the government uh, with any kind of problem that you might have, that this would be most convenient for you. uh, uh, Because if your environment, if government is able to make your living environment most natural and convenient for you, then you want to live there. And you want to participate. You want your children to grow up there. You want to uh, like make sure that your own energy is spent on making the lives of your own family better as well. And you want your government to really support that. And yeah. and I think that this is something where uh, with virtual assistance and, and more natural ways of providing services and also to make services more proactive so that you would get benefits even without knowing that you might need it uh, is something that really is going to be the future there. Mm. And it's not going to happen with just the government. It's uh, private sector has to uh, participate as well. <laughs> Inevitably, yes. Um, well, there there are two takeaways for me from from this lovely conversation. Uh, number one, the future is bright. Uh, I think both in Estonia and abroad. And number two, something that stood out uh, is is to learn from the experience, whether it's Estonia learning from African countries that go through digital transformation right now and over the next ten years, uh, and also what Estonia did uh, in the nineteen nineties regarding the ID card uh, from Finland and other countries. So um, the realization here for me is uh, dare to be second. Um, uh, yes, being first is cool, and you get the headlines sometimes but uh, you can learn a lot more from other people's experiences as well if you put your mind to it Christo, uh, thank you so much uh, for this lovely chat um, about everything uh, surrounding digitalization uh, from the infrastructure to future services. It was a pleasure. And to our dear listeners at home, thank you so much for listening and we're looking forward to hearing you for the next time. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. And that's the end of yet another thought-provoking conversation about the art of digitalization. In the meantime, make sure to stay connected with eEstonia on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. You can also check out our website e-estonia.com to learn more about digitalization in this beautiful country and other upcoming events. For now, that is all from our side. Stay tuned for our next podcast episode and have a great day. Thank you.